Good morning, Kent Cove. It's good to be with you this morning. We are uh, looking this morning at some Old Testament words from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, beginning in verse 10. It reads like this, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under, under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Please join me in prayer. Bless us this day, O Lord, with vision. May this place be a sacred place, a telling space, where heaven and earth meet. Amen. Well, if you haven't figured it out yet by now, this morning we're going to talk about money. <laughs> now, I grew up in the Midwest, and we were taught that there are three things that you don't talk about in public, and that's money, politics, and religion. I do one every week. Uh, the other I try to avoid, and this one I guess we're going to talk about. Uh, but it's interesting because in the church we have this difficulty, right? Or at least I think for me I have a difficulty in talking about it, and maybe it's my generation. You see, I grew up, I'm a child of the 80s, and so I was kind of coming of age in the era of the televangelist scandal. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker and all of the stuff that happened after that just really, I think, imprinted indelibly on me, especially as one who was feeling called to the church. And it's like, well, how do we talk about money? And it just makes us really uncomfortable. And then you add all these cultural layers on top of it where we're taught that we're not to talk about these things, politics, money, and religion. Now, I would suggest to you, and this is not our topic for today, but that part of the problem and the issue that we have in our culture right now, in America right now, in our inability to be civil to one another, is that we never learn to talk about hard things together. We instead pretended like they didn't exist, and we all see how well that worked out for us, don't we? Or perhaps our challenge in this area is that the focus in, oftentimes in the church, as we talk about hard things and as we teach, we uh, tend to lean more towards teaching people what to think and what to do with money, rather than to teach people how to think and how to be with money. You see, I think part of our challenge is that we tend more towards teaching people what to think, but when we look at the model of Jesus, Jesus teaches people how to think and how to be. 
Jesus isn't just interesting in teaching us to act well. Jesus is, teach, is interested in teaching us how to be well in the world, how to be kingdom people in the world. Jesus doesn't just want us to act like kingdom people. He actually wants us to be transformed into kingdom people. And that is work of another order, right? That's the hard stuff, which means that we have to have the hard conversations and we have to talk about the things that make us uncomfortable. And so I'm standing here this morning talking to you about money. (laughs) And I don't know if you're more uncomfortable or I'm more uncomfortable, but we're going to do it anyways. So our challenge is that. Now, another part of this, I think, is that we recognize that there's something about our relationship with money that goes to a very deep part of us, right? Richard Rohr, the Franciscan priest, says this about money. He says, money and soul have never been separate in our unconscious because they are both about human exchanges and therefore about divine exchange too. Notice how much religion uses the language of commerce, such as gaining heaven, acquiring merit, doing penance, earning salvation, losing one's soul, and deserving hell. Of course, there is also the notion of penal substitutionary atonement itself with Jesus paying the debt for our sins. On the other side, commerce uses the metaphors of religion far more than it realizes. We purchase bonds and trusts, enter into covenants, forgive debts, are granted grace periods for repayment, enjoy indemnity, reconcile accounts, and redeem coupons. So we can see that the language that we use in both our religious lives and in our uh, commercial, if you will, lives, borrow language from one another. And it influences how we understand our relationship with God. So this morning, I want to walk through this text from Ecclesiastes. I want to look at some ways that we can practically uh, take steps to hopefully improve our relationship with money and to improve our trust in God. So Ecclesiastes, as we dive into these verses, you have to understand that this is a book that is written by, all we know of this, it's historically, traditionally, it's it's ascribed to Solomon. But the text itself only refers to the teacher, Right? And so, and it's all about this understanding of how the world works. And it's just a recognition of that, ever, essentially, it's a recognition that everything we have comes from God, and everything we have belongs to God, and it's all gift. Right? So, as we're looking at these verses, I want to just walk through verse by verse and then. Uh, see where that leads us. So the first verse we read this morning, verse 10 says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. This is the refrain in Ecclesiastes. Everything is meaningless. If you're in a dark place, I would not recommend Ecclesiastes. (laughs) <laughs> because it, it, at least at first reading, is not particularly hopeful. This, too, is meaningless. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Now, this is the beginning of our conversation, right? And I think we can all recognize that, that we can see in our own lives and in culture around us and in the stories that we know that the un an unhealthy relationship with money uh, is problematic in the new testament it's framed like this in first timothy paul writes 
uh, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. A little earlier in uh, in 1 Timothy, a few verses before this, Paul lets us know that the, un, that the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Now, this, bo- this is one of those verses that's in the running for perhaps the most uh, misquoted verse in the Bible, right? Because it's, it's always money is the root of all evil. No, 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 no. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil, And again, I think all we have to do is look around us to see the ways that our culture and our um, thinking about others and um, all of this kind of these horrible things that happen in the world that are driven by the love of money, that are driven by profit above all else, right? Right? And so we can recognize that this desire, when it's out of order, does great damage not only to ourselves and our souls, but also to the wider world around us. Verses 11 and 12 go on and say, As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether they eat little or much. But as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Essentially, what the, uh, what the teacher is saying in these verses is that there is contentment in honest labor. Right? There's contentment in honest labor. There's, there's a, a kind of sleep that comes when we know that we are working hard and that we are being paid for our work, right? It, it really does seem simple in that sense. And I think if we're lucky, we have all at different periods of our life experienced that kind of contentment in our working lives. But we also recognize, as the teacher says, that the, um, as goods increase so do those who consume them. And then he goes on in verses 13 and 14, says, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Wealth hoarded. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. How far do we have to look to see examples of this? Wealth hoarded warps character. Wealth hoarded warps character, and it also, um, the, the end result is exactly what the, the teacher has just said, that we don't have contentment, right? Because what happens when we hoard wealth is that wealth becomes the primary motivator in everything we do. And we see this, how this evil works out in the world around us. We see it in corporations who ignore the common good in order to improve the bottom line. And it doesn't matter what they have to do. The only thing that matters is that wealth increases. It doesn't matter if it hurts people. It doesn't matter if it destroys community. It doesn't matter if it poisons the environment. It doesn't matter what harm it does because the only thing that matters is wealth. We can all think of examples of people, both living and dead, who uh, demonstrate or demonstrated with their lives how this warping of character takes place. The teacher also points out that wealth lost through some misfortune is a grievous evil under the sun. In other words, how do you measure success? If it all disappears, if it all disappears, where and who are you? You see, what happens when the love of money takes over is that we uh, measure our worth not our financial worth, our inherent worth, 
by how much we make, by what we do, by all of those things. That's what the love of money does. That's what that insatiable desire for wealth creates in us, and it creates this disorder in our soul so that our identity comes from the number of zeros in our IRA or in our bank accounts. To which the teacher gives this stark reminder. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb. And as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This too is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? Death is the great equalizer, in other words. And one of the things that is important to remember, I think, is this phrase. Because what happens when we get disordered in our understanding of money and our relationship to it is we start to, as uh, they say, believe our own press. And the more successful we get, the more value we think we have, and we start to look down on others, forgetting that we all came into this world naked and will all leave with nothing. One of the great cries of the Reformation, which we just celebrated uh, All Saints Day Um, In liturgical churches, they're celebrating that day today, and one of the the leaders of the the Reformation, Martin Luther, used used to say that we should keep death ever before our face. Not in a macabre way, but in this way that recognizes our humanity, right? Part of what's going on there is recognizing that we don't earn anything. Everything that we have and everything that we are is God's and it comes to us as gift. And the moment that we convince ourselves that we somehow earned it, deserve it, or, you know, more than somebody else, then we've lost sight of that fact. Now, all of this is good and important to remember, but the reality also is, is that oftentimes then we um, swing all the way to the other end where we say, well, money is bad, wealth is bad, the rich are bad, all of that, right? We we tend to not be able to hold the middle as as humans, right? We always swing to one one end of the spectrum or the other. But that's not what the teacher is saying. The teacher says here in verse 18, this is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat to drink and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them. For this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and position, possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. This is what I have observed to be good, the teacher tells us. The fact of having wealth, of having money, or having nice things, or whatever it is, is not the problem. It becomes a problem when that is the only desire that we seek after. And in fact, the teacher is saying here that we should, that it is appropriate for us to enjoy the rewards of our labor, to enjoy the blessings that God has given us, to eat, to drink, and find satisfaction in our labor. This phrase, to eat and drink, is, uh, is calling to mind for us companionship, joy, uh, satisfaction, including spiritual joys. Can you think, as we kind of look forward in these next few weeks to Thanksgiving, of uh, really a more soul-nourishing time than gathering around the table with friends and family in gratitude for all the good things that God has given us? 
and enjoying a great meal and a great glass of wine or whatever your preferred beverage of choice is and, and reveling in the goodness of the life that God has given us. To have wealth is not the problem. To be consumed by and controlled by wealth is the problem. Jesus taught in Luke that no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The NIV translates it. Now, I am not generally a King James kind of guy. I have some issues with King James uh, and his translation um, for various reasons, but this is one place where actually the King James Version gets the translation right in a way that's better than just saying um, God and money. In the King James Version, it says that you cannot serve both God and, anybody know the word? Mammon, right? That, one of the things about the, that's amazing about the King James Version, even people who don't read it, we know the words, right? But this is a different word. Mammon. Mammon. It's not just money. It's richer than that. It's deeper than that. Again, Richard Rohr writes, quoting another uh, a Jesuit theologian who says, Mammon is not simply a neutral term in Luke. It is not simply money. It connotes disorder. Mammon becomes then a source of disorder because people allow it to make a claim on them that only God can make. Mammon illness takes over when we think all of life is counting, weighing, measuring, and deserving. The love of God can't be doled out by any process whatsoever. We can't earn it. We can't lose it. As long as we stay in this world of earning and losing, we'll live in perpetual resentment, envy, or climbing. Mammon is powerful stuff. It warps us, right? It warps our understanding of not only ourselves, but especially our understanding of God. If we become sick with mammon sickness, then all of a sudden, our, even our relationship with God is about counting and earning and I deserve this, or I deserve better, or I earned it, right? Except for the fact that the cry of the gospel is that there is not one who is righteous. But we are all redeemed by the grace of God. And so, as we consider what it means to have a healthy relationship with money with possessions, we have to recognize those places where our relationship with our possessions, with our money, with our retirement accounts, with whatever it is, um, have the ability to warp our understanding of God. And it calls us to come back to this recognition that the teacher is, in Ecclesiastes is reminding us of, and that Jesus reminds us of, that everything that we have comes from God as gift, even the very breath in our lungs. And so the only appropriate response is gratitude. To have gratitude. So as we consider what it means then practically for us, to look at money and to understand our relationship to it and to try to uh, help break free of these, um, this disordered understanding that is given in our culture. We have to think about that relationship. Here's a truth that I learned in seminary that still blows my mind. Jesus talked more about money and our relationship to it than almost any other topic. Right? Jesus talked more about money and our relationship to it than all of our favorite things to focus on. And one of the reasons I'm convinced 
that we have taught one another or we repeat this thing that we don't talk about money, religion, and politics is because we don't want to engage with what Jesus taught about money. We don't want to allow the Scripture to challenge us. Here's a hard truth. We live in a capitalist society. Our whole economy is built on more, 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 and more. There is never enough. That is the engine that drives our economy. And if we don't understand that that warps our souls, then we have a lot of work to do. And I'm convinced it's part of the reason why we don't want to talk about money even though Jesus talked about it more than all of our favorite sins, most of which are not ours to struggle with. So friends, as we engage that topic, we have to uh, engage those difficult teachings. I'm convinced that two of the most difficult spiritual practices for us in our culture, to actually do our stewardship and Sabbath. And the reason is, is because they directly confront our capitalist uh, culture. They directly confront that more, more, more that we are taught from, it's in the very air we breathe, right? Right? And so when we start to think about practicing stewardship and actually taking time off to not produce intentionally every six days, it's pretty rough for us. It's a difficult thing to do. Obviously, the reality here is that this is a complex topic in some ways. And in some ways, it's quite simple. I'd like to focus on the simple this morning. And the simple is recognizing in the teaching of Ecclesiastes, in the teaching of Jesus, in the teaching of Paul, that there is at root a very simple practice that helps us heal our warped souls around money, and that is the practice of gratitude. It is the recognition that we came into this world with nothing and we will go out with nothing. It is the recognition that everything that we have and everything that we are comes as gift from God. That even though we oftentimes want to agree with uh, the old, the story that I heard years ago about the old Irish farmer who used to bless his food every night by saying, thank you, Lord, for this food, even though I work damn hard for it. (laughs) Right? Because we always want to get that earning thing in there. But the reality is, is that even when we work hard for it, it comes to us as gift. And if you don't believe that, you're not paying attention. Because we all know people, I don't care what profession you're in, where you can look at one guy who has had enormous, um, unbelievable success And your response is to look at it and go, I know that guy, and he's not doing anything different than I am. So what gives? Well, what gives is that God causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Who knows why? Sometimes it's just that simple. And I know in our country we love to to, you know live in that myth of the self-made person and pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps and all of that. But anybody who's lived adult life for more than five minutes knows that it's nothing more than a myth. Yes, there is reward for hard work, but ultimately God blesses who he will bless. And sometimes he doesn't. But all the time, Everything that we have and everything that we are is gift from God. So what is all, how do we, you know, bring all of this into our practice? I want to suggest a couple things just as ways to um, get at this, our relationship with money. 
So one of the difficult things about being a pastor and talking about money is that it's, it's never lost on anybody that obviously this is, you know, a classic conflict of interest. <laughs> right? And so it seems, diff- it, or it just causes this weird dynamic in the room. Right? But the reality is, is that Jesus taught about it, and so we're going to talk about it too. And the reality is, is that one of the ways that we recognize and we demonstrate our trust in God is our giving. It's our relationship to money. And so I want to give you three um, options to think about. Okay? So if you are not one who currently is giving, and I want you to consider what we call priority giving. Make giving back to God a priority. Right? Put it right up there with, you know, like, um, if you're self-employed, right, you know how that works. you gotta, you got to always be setting aside that, that uh, percentage to send to the IRS every quarter, right? So you make it a priority, right? And so make your giving to God a priority. Put it up at the top of the list, right up there with rent or mortgage or whatever it is. And just start there. If you already do that, then the next challenge would be to consider uh, percentage giving. Give a percentage of your income to God. Make that priority a percentage. Now, we all, uh, if you've been around the church for a long time, you know this word tithe, right? And a tithe in the Scriptures is considered typically 10%, right? And that can seem like a big number, to people. The, the, hard, the really hard part is if you take the Scripture seriously and you do some work around this, you recognize that 10% is actually the basement. That's the starting point, right? So the challenge then is, I'm, I would challenge you to, if you don't give a percentage, start giving a percentage, right? Make that priority a percentage, And then if you already do that, then consider progressive giving. If you're at 2%, and I think the national average in the church is something like 2.7%, right? So if you're at 2.7%, consider going to 3.5%. Consider upping that percentage. Increase your dependence on God's provision by increasing your percentage. Now, as is your practice here at Kent Covenant, we mailed out these promise cards last week, so you should have received them. If you don't, there's, um, they're at the Welcome Center desk, and you can pick them up. And so this is just a tool for you to consider that relationship with, give, with giving. And you can fill out this uh, bigger part, and that's for you to keep, right? And then you tear off, actually this part, you, you tear off, and you put this in the envelope that was included with it. And then later on in the year, we will mail that to you to remind you of that uh, promise or pledge that you made. Then we ask that you tear off this smaller sheet, which is anonymous, and just write that amount in there, and we will be collecting those at the Thanksgiving uh, gratitude service. And this is simply does two things. Okay, the first is, it's an opportunity for you to do some work around that uh, money thing, right? How are you trusting God with your money? The second thing it allows us to do is it, allow, it helps us in our budget planning process. It just gives us a little bit of an extra window into how to budget for the next year, which is a process that we have already started. So uh, we commend that to you. And uh, we encourage you to participate if you feel so led. Um, All of that to say, the hard part in this, as with many spiritual practices, is that we have to recapture the tension between being and doing. Our default as Americans is the doing side, right? And so we have to get that balance between being and doing and reflecting about where we actually are in our practices is a helpful way to do that. 
In the meantime, we recognize that in this conversation is an invitation from God to recognize that He has blessed us, that He has loved us, that we are invited to join God at the table, which is the precursor to that great banquet feast when Christ comes again. I want to just share with you some descriptions from the prophet Isaiah of what that will look like. Because it's hard for us to recognize as we live in that now and not yet, where we still, you know, we still have to work. We still have to get a paycheck, right? Life doesn't happen for free. And yet we trust that God is with us and God provides for us. And that one day, as Isaiah says in chapter 25, he says, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken." It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him so that He might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in His salvation. And then later in Isaiah in chapter 55, this invitation. Come all you who are thirsty. Come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on that, on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare.